Hi, uh, welcome to the first in this series of um, uh, little videos for The World Transformed. This is our course uh, on capitalism and COVID, and I'm Jeremy Gilbert. And the point of this course is to really both think about, you know, the nature of the moment that we're living through at the moment, the reasons why um, things are happening the way they're happening at this very weird historical moment, and also to think about well, what this tells us about some general features of capitalism. And when we use this word capitalism, I think it's important to clarify to some extent what we mean. Capitalism, I think, firstly, is always best understood in quite simple terms. It's just a practice, it's something that you do. Practice is the, and it it's the practice of, of, as economists put it, accumulating capital. It just, in other words, just generating profits. So when we talk about capitalism in a more general sense, as a sort of whole type of society or a whole social order or a whole culture, we're talking about a society in which basically it, everything we do almost is is geared ultimately towards creating profits for somebody not and not just little bits of profit either not just enough you know for some business owner to you know buy a boat with but huge amounts of you know of capital uh, is the kind of end result of of, of almost all of our activity uh, and that's really what we mean when we talk about capitalism we'll be thinking on this course about how it is that living in a society that really prioritizes the accumulation of vast, unlimited profits by a tiny number of people and corporations ends up having a, a massive effect on what becomes possible and not possible in so many aspects of our lives. Uh, and today we're going to sort of start from a question, which is really a simple question, but it's one that hasn't been asked very much in the press or in the media as far as I've seen. And that's, well, why is the thing, the aspect of the COVID pandemic crisis that most people are most worried about? Um, is unemployment. I mean, that's the thing. If you ask most people that why is COVID causing them concern, it's not that even that they're scared of catching it, it's they're scared that they or people they know or lots of people in their society are going to be made unemployed. But if you think about it for a moment, there's nothing, there's no obvious reason, logical reason why a massive pandemic should, should lead to mass unemployment. In fact, historically, you know, the, the the worst pandemic in that we know of in, in sort of in recorded history is the Black Death, the, the disease that killed a third of the population in Europe in the Middle Ages, and that resulted in a massive labour shortage. In fact, social and economic historians tell us it it it, it ended up raising the price of labour, like raising wages for the poorest people, um, and you know, for generations afterwards. So why are we? So this is a question we've got to address. Well, why is it the case? What is going on with our society? that a massive pandemic creates a situation in which people are terrified of losing their jobs. And we want to go on from that to think about the question of, well, what is actually the role of work in our society? And why, you know, what is what is what kinds of work are done in our society and why? And what is it even for? And so to that end, we're going to be talking to Sarah Jaffe, who's, uh, who's a journalist and a writer. She's the author of two books, uh, Necessary Trouble and the forthcoming Work Won't Love You Back. Uh, she's a labour journalist. She's a very um, sort of excellent and respected uh, investigative journalist, really, on the left. I mean, one of relatively few. I can't think of many people of my generation who I would call an investigative, investigative journalist in the classic sense. Um, and so Sarah's really an expert on this sort of topic. So I suppose I would like to ask Sarah, really, to begin with, you know, what is, from your um uh, from your point of view, well, you know, what what is the link between a uh, COVID and you know a massive, you know, this massive pandemic, which is essentially, you know, of sort of viral health crisis and unemployment? You know, why is it having that effect? It's interesting because I had not asked myself this question in the same way until we discussed doing this call, and then it's like, huh, why is that the thing? Because I think there's three things that are happening, right? We have a pandemic. But it's not actually, I mean, it's killing a lot of people. I don't want to sound like I'm saying this is, oh, it's not that bad. It's killing a lot of people. But it's not killing that many working age people compared to the effect that it's actually had. And part of the reason that we're, we're talking in England, I'm actually from the U.S. and spent most of lockdown in the U.S., these are countries that didn't really manage lockdown very well. And so the unemployment crisis that we're having is largely because we've still got this sort of dragged out thing where people are on like semi lockdown rather than locking down sort of fast and hard so that we could then reopen in some sort of a semi normal manner. Things are, you know, sort of open, not really. 
Um, and then the last thing that I was thinking about is the way that these are countries that we're talking about, the ones that we're living in, um, that don't rely so much on the manufacturing sector anymore for unemployment. So the things that are being shut down when we are on lockdown are services and services, food service, um, retail, things like that. These make up a much bigger part of our economy than they would have even, you know, 40 years ago, let alone hundreds of years ago during the Black Death. And when we're talking about the, the difference between something that killed a massive swath of working age people versus something that's mostly killing elderly people um, and that is in turn shutting down big factors of big sectors of our economy that we depend on for now months at a time. I think that's where we've got this crisis and this is what's happening. And I've been joking that, you know, my fallback plan if journalism started to fail me again was going back to waiting tables. But now that's not a fallback plan because there aren't any jobs waiting tables. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I mean, I, and I think that really, I mean, that point, the, the, I mean, the extent to which is indeed in countries like the UK and the US in particular, we're in this advanced sort of service economy where yeah. essentially people are, you know, we're, we're all we're all making money doing things for each other. It really, you know, it raises the yeah, it raises a number of questions. It raises the question of how necessary all those things are, yeah. but also, as you said, you know, the, the ways in which we've become completely dependent upon, you know, up, up, upon you know this very weird way of organising all of our social activity. I mean, I you know, it's a, I guess it's a point I always make when I'm talking to people about the general concept of capitalism that you know one thing that characterizes a, a, a capitalist society as we call it is that it's completely dependent on people buying and selling stuff that basically everything we get everything we have all the stuff the, the t-shirts like the books on my room you know the guitar you know the cup of tea i'm drinking everything is something that's been bought and sold for profit which is a really weird way of people living i mean that's not you know for most i mean up until even in britain which is the home of the industrial revolution up until about 300 years ago most of this stuff and most of the stuff you have in your life is stuff you've made or you know the person who made it so it's a very weird situation in which we're sort of completely dependent upon each other and i think it's worth reflecting you know before we get into thinking more just about work specifically it's worth reflecting i think that you know the pandemic is isn't it to some extent the the the, the pandemic itself you know various people have suggested is a product of that system it's a product of that system. It's a product of a society which is which you have this highly globalized economy, in which people and things are circulating all around the world at breakneck speed, like constantly, at which people are kind of increasingly in very close contact with each other in cities. You know, um, that's one of the features of human society that's only really become sort of generalized just in the past 30 years it's only in the past 30 years that we've gone from being a species that mostly lives in the countryside to one that mostly lives in cities and it's you know the destruction of the environment the destruction of of, um, na of, sort of natural landscapes the dis the creation of weird relationships between humans and animal populations these have all exacerbated haven't they the conditions of the pandemic Absolutely. And I think there's a line that um, Kim Moody wrote early on, which he said that the pandemic travels along the roots of capital. Um, and when you saw that, right, it's interesting because it was mostly transmitted around the world by sort of wealthy business travelers. But then the people that it's killed are poorer. They are disproportionately black. They are disproportionately immigrant. They're disproportionately people who are you know, vulnerable to all sorts of things that capitalist society does badly. And so, you know, the, the sort of class bias of this thing is interesting in that, like, yes, anyone can get sick. Boris Johnson had it and was very sick. But the people that it's going to kill, once again, are people who have pre-existing conditions, um, people who are in situations where they're made more vulnerable. Um, we talk a lot about care homes, nursing homes, where um, people who are elderly and sick are sort of, you know, often it's often described as sort of warehousing people, right? Um, and one of the ways in which the virus spread early on in the U.S. was that these care homes are staffed by people who don't make enough money at one job. So they often work at two different care homes. So they would pick it up at one and then spread it to the next one going to their second job. And there was no testing and there was no, importantly, like paid sick time for people in low wage work. So this is how it spread because people had no choice but to go to work. 
And I've actually, yesterday I was talking to some people who work at Bojangles, which is a fast food restaurant in the Southern United States, who went on strike because they found out that one of their coworkers had tested positive. They'd all been exposed. The company wasn't going to tell them who or what and just kept telling them to show up to work. And this is the best part of this whole story. Bojangles makes chicken and biscuits and they had t-shirts for the workers that said, risk it for the biscuit. Yeah. Well, that, is, that is incredible. Right? Right? And we've That's had, yeah. <laughs> perfect. And there's been various analogous cases here, like the the, the, the parts of the UK where there's been local uh, you know, outbreaks that have resulted yeah. in local intense lockdowns. They've Many of them have been connected to situations where people are doing really low paid warehouse work. Mm -hmm. People are working in sweatshops. People are working in these really people who can't afford to, to stay home if their employer makes them you know, go to work and their employers feel feel able to make them go to work have been you know transmission vectors for the disease um i should say we should you know we should sort of keep defining terms as we go along here and i get that i should just re I, I, um you mentioned you know you mentioned the pandemic following the circuit of capital and when we use the word capital in that way we're talking about well, basically we mean money but we mean money that is money in particular that can be used for investment purposes so but whenever we talk about capital, we're talking about that. We're talking about money that can be used to generate more money. And um, and you raised the question of class, which I think we're going to come back to sort of in a, in a few minutes, like kind of what we mean by that, like what, how we <laughs> define it. But there's a, but you've also raised there kind of implicitly a much more a sort of fundamental question, and it's one which has been a, on a lot of people's minds since the beginning of the pandemic, which is really just well, what is what is work for? You know, what is work for in our society? Mm -hmm. Why and and whose work matters? Who's working valued and by whom? So, yeah. I mean, what, what would be your your immediate answer to that question? Like, what do what does work for? Or what is, who do it be for and what is it for? Yeah, under capitalism, work is to produce profits, right? Um, we can get sort of very basic and talk about the um, idea that profits come from surplus value, which is created by your employer essentially paying you less in wages than the value that you produce for something, whether that is making a sandwich at Bojangles, whether that is making an article for the New York Times, whether that is making a course at a university, or whether that is making a shirt in a factory. Um, the boss is able to make more money off of the thing you produce than he is going to pay you for it. And I sort of, uh, I mean, that sort of comes to the question, actually, the next question yeah. I wanted to talk about, which is, well, who, you know, who decides, actually, who decides what work gets done? And who gets rewarded for it? Because in, in uh, as, as I've sort of already answered the question to some extent, <laughs> that's basically decided by the people who've got you know the the, the power because yeah. they've got access to the resources. It's also to some extent extent decided by governments. But I think it's clearly an important you know it's a fundamental political question, isn't it? It's a fundamental question yeah. for any kind of democracy. What is you know who gets to decide these questions? Yeah, I think, and this is another place where I think the pandemic sort of exposed the way things work, right? Because like suddenly it became very clear that like, you know, a lot of governments, certainly the government in the UK and the government in the US right now would like to say that, you know, oh, we don't decide that, you know, business decides that the market, the, the invisible hand of the market decides um, what is necessary and what is not necessary. But it became very, very clear that somebody was actually making the decisions about what was necessary, which businesses were allowed to stay open. You know, Donald Trump famously sort of made an executive order after one of his buddies in, in food processing called him up saying that these plants had to stay open even if there was an outbreak in them. Um, so it became very clear that the government does in fact have a lot to do with deciding what work gets done, where and by whom, um, and for how much money. Um, I wanted to, the, I've got a cat who's trying to get on the keyboard. <gasps> Hi, kitty. <laughs> there we go. So. Hi. Oh. <laughs> so the thing I wanted to get onto now is this question yep. Of class, of what, of the idea of class and social class, and and its relationship mm. to work. And on the one hand, there's the sort of everyday sense that basically what class means is like is what job you do and how much prestige that job has. So if you're someone who does like a high status job, like you know a, a TV journalist or a you know professor or whatever, then then you you belong to some sort of a kind of elite group. And if you do a job like being a care worker or you know being a refuse worker or what have you then which is regarded as low status then that also is what that is what defines your class identity and then on the other hand there's the classic 
Marxist understanding, the, the understanding that comes from the, the Germans, the economist and philosopher and social theorist Karl Marx, which says that, well, really, all that stuff is sort of superficial. And that actually, what really defines your place in society is something in a capitalist society, is something much more basic. And it's it's the question of whether you are one of the people who has to go out and sell their labor to live. You have to go out and work for a wage or a salary, however high or low it is. Or whether you're one of the people who gets who has enough capital that they can invest or they can effectively they can directly or indirectly employ other people to work for them, and thereby exploit them and extract their surplus value, as you called it, um, and as Marx called it. So, um, so what do you what are your thoughts about this? What are your thoughts about the way in which people think about the relationship between work and their position in society and their sort of personal identity today? Yeah, I think we've been having a sort of protracted battle about what class is in sort of the media. And again, in the UK and the US, it's been very similar, um, especially since sort of the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of Brexit and with it, Boris Johnson, um, is this question of like, who is the working class and what kinds of work count and what kinds of work, again, matter. Um, and I think that partly because of the period of time you were talking about, right, where trade unions managed to eke out a sort of compromise with capital to give a certain kind of worker decent jobs and decent time off, decent pay, decent vacation. Um, in the U.S. it came with private health insurance. Here it came with the building of the NHS. Um, then people sort of assume that those workers who were mostly involved in building that period of semi-stability are the workers and everybody else is kind of something else. And when in reality, I think once again, as we've talked about already that the switch from a manufacturing based economy to a services based economy, we have to look at all the different kinds of work that people are doing and the ways in which like our old definitions of class are maybe based more in some assumptions about race, gender and geography than they are about people's actual class position in the economy. So I think these are interesting questions that, that we you know, could probably unpack for the next three years, but really we should understand that, that fundamentally the division is still between those of us who sell our labor for a wage and the people who we sell it to. Yeah, I think that that's really helpful, thanks. And I, I, th I think that's right. At the same time, there's something which I think is not very complex about the, the relationship between you know, wealth, capital, and those who control it, and labour, and people who live off that, which has been a fairly simple constant of capitalist society since the 19th century. And that is that, well, basically, capitalists, in other words, the people who have the money and capital to invest and are able to employ other people to work with them to generate profits, are always looking for ways to reduce the amount of money they have to spend. Yeah, and we can even understand, for instance, the way that women have been historically oppressed as a way to reduce the price of labor. In the case of the price of women's labor, it was to reduce it to the price of free. So right. if you can convince people that they should be doing the cooking and the cleaning and the child rearing and all of those things in the home and not for a wage, then that reduces the price of labor, it reduces the price of, of you know, social reproduction, um, which I'm sure you're going to talk about later in the series. So I shouldn't go too deep into it. So how how do we go as workers, as the people who live only by sending out work, how do we go about uh, improving our situation? This is the really tough one. And this is the thing that my friend Joshua Clover called like the affirmation trap, which is suddenly after the 1970s, when you start outsourcing jobs to wherever, closing the factories and the mines in the UK and the US and moving them to India and Bangladesh and China and wherever they can get cheaper, easier to exploit labor, um, you end up with the sort of spectacle of workers begging for plants to stay open. This happened in the General Motors strike in the US last year. And it's much harder, in fact, for workers to convince capital to create jobs than it is for them to refuse to do the jobs they've got. And so this is what we call a strike, right? When people refuse to work, um, usually for some period of time until their demands are met. And that's the thing, right? Is it like labor has the most power when capital needs it. 
and when it can refuse to work and prevent other people from coming in and taking those jobs and say like, nope, we're not going to do it. So where are the levers of strike power now when capital just doesn't need as many workers? Um, and that's been the interesting thing. And we've seen things like walkouts of Amazon warehouse workers, um, the Bojangles workers that I was talking about that went on strike, workers who have been told suddenly that they are essential in a pandemic, then figuring out like, oh, if I'm so essential, and also if this job, this job that used to be an okay job, now it might threaten my life, it's a little bit harder to get people to want to step up and take those jobs, even with high unemployment. What can you do? Where are the levers of strike power? And then there's another thing, which, you know, I wake up in the morning um, about, you know, 7, 8 a.m. UK time and look at Twitter. It's the middle of the night in the U.S. and a bunch of cities are on fire. And that's another thing that happens when you get mass unemployment is that you get riots. And so the question of, of class power is sort of, you know, it, it, it always hinges a little bit on how much hell the working class can raise. Um, and if they have been denied the ability to raise that hell at the ballot box, um, and I don't have to talk to anybody who's watching a TWT video about that too much, they're going to do it other ways. And it might be a strike, which can be fairly orderly, or it might be other ways to cause trouble. All right. So, Sarah, can you what can you tell us about the about the latest goings on in the world of labour organising, work, workplace organising, trade union activism, especially people who are trying to confront these new conditions? Yeah. So I talked about I sort of dropped a lot of mentions of a lot of organising that's gone on and people who aren't necessarily in unions yet, but are organising and acting like unions. And I think that's kind of Number one is that uh, I call it the Newsies rule from the, the Disney movie, where he says, if we strike, then we're a union, which is kind of fundamentally true, right? Um, there are also big things that are called unions that are people are members of that actually have institutional power that does things like weigh in on the Labour Party um, and have some, although much less, impact on the Democratic Party in the U.S. And they have... Um, contracts with employers sometimes. They have, um, you know, these abilities to, to sort of negotiate in different ways. But fundamentally, the power still sort of comes from organizing in the workplace. And so the places that we've seen militant workplace organizing recently um, have been, in some cases, among these kinds of workers that we're talking about as essential workers, key workers, food service workers, um, over here, you know, like Deliveroo drivers going on strike and things like that. And then the other place we've been seeing a lot of militancy is actually among caring workers. And so that's teachers, that's nurses. Um, in each case, these are people who are, you can't pick their job up and move it to Bangladesh very easily, right? You want, people want their kid to go to a school in the neighborhood. In fact, we're having big fights about that right now as people, you know, reopen schools during a pandemic. Or nurses, you need the nurse to be in the hospital with you to give you health care. She can't do it over Zoom. So these are people who do still have sort of a large amount of power in the workplace, even though they don't have it against sort of traditional capital in the same way. And we're finding that that power ends up being political in a different way. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually, because they, I guess then there's basically two sets of workers who really do have a, a considerable power to put pressure on as organised workers at the moment. There's the group you just referred to, the care workers, people engaged in, as we say, social reproduction, this phrase you used earlier, which just social reproduction just means really the reproduction of society. That It means keeping things going, basically keeping people alive, keeping looking after children, looking after old people, looking after our bodies, looking after homes to make sure they don't become you know, toxic in their messiness or and also, you know, look, teaching people and things like this. I mean, really, to some extent, everybody from, you know, a, a mother at home with a new baby or a father at home with a new baby to, a, you know, to a university professor who's engaged in some form of social reproduction. And at least we've seen with, you know, what, what a kind of crisis it causes when schools have to be closed. You've seen that we now live in a society where people engaged in social reproduction at various levels do have real capacity to sort of shut things down and make demands if they want to. And then there's also people involved in various kinds of logistics. I mean, this is a point made by in that, um, that the big that book bigger than Bernie. Who are those guys? Megan Day, Day and Megan and Day, and, and, yeah. yeah, that's right. They make a very useful point, uh, a very very interesting book about you know what should become of the 
democratic socialist movement in America after the Bernie Sanders campaign. And um, they make the point that logistics workers, I think it's them I'm thinking of, they make the point that logistics workers, people indeed, as you said, at the Amazon warehouses, mm -hmm. do, if, if they could be organised, then they would have like incredible power actually to just to shut down like entire economies. And that is really sort of important. They actually recommend that people, this is relevant to thinking about work acting, the kinds of work people do. They recommend as a political strategy that people should just give up trying to get, um, you know, jobs in universities and the media sector and the creative industries and just go, go get unionized jobs in those other sectors where they can organize and build towards socialism. So I don't, uh, it's an in, which is an interesting argument, um, but that's yeah, that's really useful. Kind of that's a really useful observation, I think. Yeah, the logistics sector. I once interviewed some port truck drivers who worked at the port of Savannah, Georgia, and that's where a whole bunch of the goods that get sold across the southeast of the United States come in. And this one guy kind of looked at me with a smile, and he's like, "We stop working on." Monday and by Wednesday, every Walmart in the South has empty shelves. And that's, yes. that's what happens when you outsource the production work to one specific place. Everything comes in on these container ships and then they have to be unloaded and moved. And so you create choke points where certain smaller and smaller groups of workers, because in part some of these things have been automated, have more and more power. And that's that quote from that worker that, you know, if we stop working on Monday, the shelves are empty in Walmart by before Friday, yeah. whatever day it was. Um, it really it's a fantastic concrete illustration of one of the basic principles about the nature of capitalism as a whole type of society that was made by Marx and has been made by subsequent socialist thinkers. And that is the point that there's this real contradiction in the way that we inhabit and experience capitalist society in that we are. We're encouraged to think of ourselves and our fellow workers and other consumers essentially as individuals competing with each other, competing okay. with each other for access to jobs, competing with each other for access to status, competing for each other uh, with each other for access to resources or, you know, mm -hmm. followers on Twitter or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. the, um, but in fact, we're living in a society where more than at any other point in human history, we're incredibly interdependent. We're totally dependent on each other. Like none of us, we can't eat if that guy in the warehouse stops working. You know, we yeah. can't, and he won't eat if we stop buying the stuff. Yeah. So we're actually fantastically interdependent. And yeah. one of the experiences of the COVID crisis has been us all seeing the extent to which, as you said very early on in our discussion, Tara, governments, you know, do have the capacity if they want to, to start directing all of this activity that we're all engaged in all of the time and redirecting it in different ways to produce the outcomes that they want. And so there's no objective reason why all that social activity that we're all engaged in, you know, whether it's looking after babies or working in a warehouse or teaching political theory, can't be organised in a way that benefits everybody. Yeah, I think the thing that having to go through lockdown on you know, a global scale really taught us is how interdependent we are, how we are all only as healthy as the sickest person we've last interacted with and how necessary it is to not just appreciate that work, not just sort of clap for it every Thursday, but like materially value it. But that kind of experience of solidarity is a thing that, um, and not to get too into the weeds on neoliberalism, but like the last 40 years of political change has tried to strip out of us and to teach us that all we do is compete with each other for all of those things that you just mentioned. And so having an experience of solidarity rather than competition, this is what gave trade unions actually their power, right? It was people getting together to work together to actually improve their lives, their working conditions, but also their neighborhoods, their communities, all of these things. So it's not just in the workplace, although the workplace is very important. You can also exercise that by joining your local tenants union, say, and helping prevent people from being evicted. Um, all of these ways to actually express solidarity, mutual aid networks, things like that. Um, the pandemic gave people an experience of that maybe we hadn't, a lot of us had before. And that is exactly what we need to actually go forward and think about like, what if there was a better way to organize our lives than working 40 something hours a week for a boss who is exploiting our labor? Okay, great. That's a great, that's a really good close, I think.
Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, I think, uh, well, thanks. I mean, Sarah, that's fantastic. I mean, that was exactly what we were hoping for. And, um, and um, uh, if you're watching this before uh, Wednesday, September, is it Wednesday? Is it the 2nd? Yeah, Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020, then you can join us, Sarah and myself, for a live discussion as part of the Will Transform 2020 Festival uh, online. So uh, look out for that. Okay, thanks for joining us and thanks very much, Sarah. That's fantastic. Yeah, thanks for having me.